Hi there, and we're back. Well, I'm back from death's door. Uh, Welcome back. Glad well, you made you. it. I made it. Yeah, uh, good to have you back. But I'm surprised that you're still partaking in this. Well, I, I, I must say I was forced to have some uh, serious discussions with my doctor, my next of kin, and other important people in my life. But mm. anyway, focus on the doctor. And, uh, well, okay, my doctor's been on the show, mm. uh, Dr. Simba. Mm. But uh, between him and I, we convince each other that reasonable quantities are okay. Okay. Because you know that you're not taking reasonable quantities. <laughs> <laughs> well, what he reckons is reasonable is not exactly what I would say is reasonable. Yeah, but you're a teetotal. Yeah, no, no. That's so okay. even a drop is not reasonable for you? No, 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 no. I think uh, a glass a day is reasonable. But we all know that you're taking more than a glass a day. No, no. We, I, I have a glass. It's just bottomless. <laughs> At least you're honest with us. <laughs> Could you be more honest with your doctor? Uh, well, he watches the show. <laughs> <laughs> so he's got some sense. Okay. Anyway, it's, it's really good to be back with you guys. Uh, I see you've improved your dress sense while I've been away. Although last week you had uh, turquoise socks. Did I say that I don't know that... He, yes, you said that correctly. Although I don't know that this yeah, is an improvement. Are... I mean, this. I feel like it's very hot... In, in what you're wearing? Well, it's been raining. It's uh, The weather has not exactly... I mean, his excuses, he's been unwell, but I don't yeah. know, you know. Well, I try to keep the cold, you know, out of my system at all costs. But, mm. yeah. No, you should. You should. I should, yeah. Anyway, what are you drinking? Should we even... Ask? Okay. Uh, I'm this is what you had the last time I was here. Not exactly. It's three different types of tea. Oh, they're different. Oh, oh yeah. They actually and then what? You blend them? Well, there's that too, and that's what we've tried to do today. And? And uh, it's, it's fantastic. It's, uh, it's fabulous. So it's English fine tea, and it's, yeah. So the Earl Grey, the afternoon tea, and the breakfast tea just blended it together. And oh, I know yeah. why you're dressed normally. Mm. One of the viewers said we should start calling you Sekalas. Colors. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was hilarious, actually. <laughs> so, thank you. Well, At least wait, he's wait, done. wait until next week. <laughs> and what are we having? We're having a much more interesting blend of things, uh, as always. Which on this. George should not be having. Well, look, I trust being him. a bad friend. I, I trust his doctor. So, this, <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is from the House of Centauri. It's the Toki. It's the poorer cousin of the Hibiki, which we we had on an earlier season. Uh, it's excellent value for money. Yeah, it is. Uh, yep, it is. Um, um, I once bought a bottle of this for the show. Yes. And I left it in your custody. Which wasn't very wise. <laughs> Just never <laughs> made it on set. <laughs> anyway, so here we are, mid-November, which is an interesting time in the history of this country. Uh, you know, if we sort of glance over our shoulders uh, over the last 60-odd years, uh, this time in uh, 1965, UDI was being declared, which in itself was a coup. Uh, this time in 2017, there was a coup, which wasn't a coup. I think the word we use now is uh, military would, would you say transition. UDI was a coup? Because that was a, a political event, right? Because a coup, a coup d'etat, if and you think about it, uh, involves the uh, military intervention. Of, what, so what's a palace coup? It's still a military intervention as well. That's why it's a coup. That's why it's called a coup. Well, look, I, I think I think um, you know you, you can debate it. You can debate either side quite uh, uh, convincingly, because um, the Smith regime did not have the power uh, or the authority to actually declare independence from um, Britain. Uh, why not? Because if you look at uh, the reasons that Smith gave and his coterie of supporters, was America declared its independence. And that was a coup. Britain, it, it, right? It's called the American Revolution for a reason, right? Yeah. They, they literally had a war <laughs> shortly after. And um, after UDI was declared in 1965... Oh, are, we going, are we going to rabbit hole? The, the Brits actually... But oh, that's This is what happens when you're... When you're <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually still trying to introduce the show. <laughs> the Brits actually considered invading to remove this. Is it, is it okay if I finish introducing the show? Yeah, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and then maybe you can say some of these things later. So, 1965... Uh, UDI, mm -hmm. S soft coup. Uh, Twenty seventeen. Is this soft a thing? coup? 
Anyway, carry on. Uh, but also in between, this time of the year, in 1979, uh, we are in the middle of Lancaster. So basically, November is an anniversary of significant transitions. Yeah, I think that's history. how you should introduce it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you approve of that word? I, I think so. Okay, yeah. so transitions in the history of this country. Significant moments. Moments? Well, since you sound like you've done some homework on this, why um, does the current government call itself the Second Republic? I'm not entirely sure. And I did A-level history, and I have my views on whether that's the correct use of Second Republic or not. But anyway, you're not moderating. <laughs> <laughs> um, we forget that George is bad. <laughs> So, but, but I mean, looking at these sort of three epochs in the history of this country, uh, maybe just focusing for now on the economics, how does the current epoch measure against, or how, how do the last five years measure against the previous two epochs? Okay, so uh, if we look at purely economics uh, badly, if you look at the last five years, uh, we had... The first year was relatively good. So if we look at 2018, we had an economic growth of around uh, 4%. And then 2019, 2020, we had uh, the depression. So a two-year depression where economic Depression growth or had, recession? Uh, depression, because it was two years. It was more than just two quarters. Uh, and it was negative growth of uh, 8%, 8%, those two years, and then recovery. So that's cumulative about 20? You know, you had... A cumulative will be 16%, but you had growth of... Uh, oh, we're going to have this argument with it. Okay, yes, yeah. 8 and 8. 8 and 8, uh, and then some sort of uh, recovery that happened in 2021, which was uh, 7%, 6 point something percent, according to the, the World Bank. Uh, and I think that's that's the issue. The issue but, but, is but Mugabe, negative Mugabe growth. But Mugabe had extended periods okay, so, of similarly <laughs> negative growth. So, and they, he didn't have COVID to contend with? Yeah, no, 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 you, you're, you're quite right. Uh, but when we look at Mugabe, we need to be also be very careful, right? Yes, we, we always have at, to be very careful. We need to be very <laughs> careful. Um, <laughs> what we are saying is we're giving... Although you emulate his dress sense. Uh, I don't know about that, but <laughs> anyway. Uh, what, I'm more French than I am English in my dressing, in case you haven't noticed. Oh, right. okay. Okay. No, we haven't. <laughs> okay. You wouldn't know the difference, but anyway, yeah. And he was more English than he was French. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Anyway, carry on. Okay. And I think some are more Italian, but I'm not Italian at all. I'm more French uh, than English or Italian. But what I was trying to say is, you know, he was given a mandate in 2013, and that new mandate, we judge, we're judging him on that new ma mandate of uh, 2013. Uh, or the previous mandate when we had a GNU between uh, 2009 and, right? So we're seeing what had been happening uh, before the coup, because the coup had a specific mandate, which was the economy was in the doldrums, and we we're going to rescue the economy. Was well, it about the economy? No, no, but anyway, let's not get into the no, politics okay, yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah, let's yeah, just yeah. focus on the, the, on the economics. economics. And yeah. I'm just using that, and I'm saying that uh, the last five years have been disastrous when we look at the economics and when we look at economics over the last, uh, you know, since 2009, Mugabe as an economic purveyor of any sort was disastrous. So for these new guys to start on a really bad way, the way but, the economy but, but, is but, going, uh, I think says a lot about um, that we haven't learned. But, but isn't it just because they, they inherited Mugabe's mess? Well, uh, you remember Mtuli's famous speech when he came into uh, the Treasury and he basically said, guys, the Treasury is empty and we've got big problems here. That's not true. Uh, Tendebiti inherited exactly the same mess. There was absolutely nothing in the Treasury. And I give this as a very good example. And I say that in 2019, we had a clean... So you could say that about 2017 and 2018. 2019, we actually had a clean slate where Mtuli said, we're starting again. And he total money supply, he changed currencies, he changed everything, he changed the economy, and he says, you know what, give me six months, this thing will no, be sorted out. Well, in, no, but um, you, you say he, he, he didn't get rid of everything because his foreign liabilities remained. No, what we're saying is, yes, those were always a problem, right? 
but he said is we're on a new course, we're on a new trajectory. So if we're judging them, we start judging them and we say, okay, this is this had nothing to do with what was happening prior. But in 2019, they gave us a new currency. The total money supply in Zimbabwe was 10 billion. And from 10 billion as of August this year, it's 1.6 trillion. But we had we had COVID in between. So did any so did most countries. And actually, COVID helped Zimbabwe to a to a large extent because a lot of our demand actually waned and demand for currency actually waned and it was actually okay for us. We actually recovered. Uh, it could have been worse without COVID. Okay, so, I think that's absurd. This idea that COVID was good for us. Uh, <laughs> but I said it could have been worse. It could have been worse um, but without COVID. Where I want to push back um, is this uh, idea that um, when you compare the, the last Mugabe epoch between 2013 and 2017, and the five years of the Second Republic, I think that we have. To, I think the Second Republic has done better than that epoch, uh, although the bar is extremely low. Let him finish. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm just. We want to see. Stop the interrupting. Facts. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> I think that if you, so if you think, if you look at things like um, the infrastructure uh, spend and development. Uh, in the five-year tenure of the Second Republic, it's uh, a lot more was done and and spent in that space than mm -hmm. uh, in the last five years of the Mugabe regime. Um, if you look at uh, a lot of the initial, um, well, actually, wait. Uh, sorry, having said, you can't interrupt you. No, no, yeah, let's yeah, not. Let's let can't. Let him. Let him carry on. You, uh, no, uh, no, 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 no. Don't. Please go. <laughs> So so I think I'm going to go back to my sick bed. <laughs> you, you guys on, clearly us, do whatever you want. Yeah. And then we will rebut it later on, but I think uh, you know, so, we should certainly give you a chance. Okay, so, so so that's one. Secondly, I think they signaled a pivot which they didn't follow through on, but I think all the things that they signaled in the months after November 2017 were actually very positive in terms of the country being open for business, in terms of removing indigenization, uh, the requirement that anybody investing in a company in Zimbabwe would have to partner a, a, an indigenous um, or a previously disadvantaged group and um, make sure that they owned at least 51% of the business. I think that was a big deal. Um, and when you look at the cabinet that was uh, put together um, in, in the first election after the coup, you had people with no political baggage who have... Um, impeccable business credentials included. Now, did I think, they... I think you're using impeccable very liberally. <laughs> now, did... And I noticed he hasn't even quoted one statistic. statistic. No, no, I, I, I talked about... The, the, the stats are awful, <laughs> right? So, and, so I'm, I'm not... I'm not I, I, and what's his question? No, no, no. Hear me out. What I'm saying is, I'm comparing the, uh, the last epoch of the Mugabe era, 2013 to 2017, why do you conveniently years. pick those dates? No, no. no, it doesn't matter. Even if you do, George's question is when we look at the epoch, Mugabe's epoch, and we look at uh, the Second Republic epoch, and yep. we're, we're focusing on the economic, broad economic indicators. Now, I don't know anyone who goes into Turkey and says, ah, actually, Turkey is much better than it was, uh, despite inflation going up, which is now higher than it used to be, despite an economic depression of two years, despite all this, actually, they changed one or two laws, and I think those laws were very positive. I think that's missing the point altogether. No, so well, I, did you, you remember that uh, so Tuesday, out, Tuesday evening or Thursday evening that Mugabe resigned? That midweek evening. I think it was a Tuesday night, right? I don't, I don't quite remember. I, I think but, it was but, the 21st of November. But we, we were together that, that evening. And we had a party. <laughs> He took over the DJ booth in the bar. It was a Tuesday because they had no stuff in the bar. He <laughs> became the DJ in the bar. Um, how much were we paying for a beer? I don't remember. Cents. The local beer was cents, not a dollar. No, look, I'm, 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 not, I'm not by any stretch of the imagination making the case that things, are, things are better. 
No, no, but you're saying... I, I, I'm just saying, I'm saying... I'm, no, 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 I'm not. That's actually your argument. No, that's not my argument. Uh, I'm simply saying... Economic data, please. Tomorrow. I'm simply saying that when you compare... He's justifying having led the celebrations. <laughs> I'm just... Look, we I, all I, celebrated. I, let's be frank. We all celebrated. I, I even attended the inauguration. Oh, really? Oh, yes, I did. And that was like actually my first... Uh, foray in an inauguration okay. of any kind. How come you didn't tell us? No, no, no. I even posted on uh, on Facebook. So I was I was actually quite happy mm -hmm. that because uh, I ca I cannot even up to now. I know that there are a lot of people who think that um, you know the coup was not the best thing uh, for us to have done. I cannot see how Mugabe would have left power. I cannot without a coup. I cannot see it. And I think that there was a a good starting point. I think there was a there was so much confidence in the new republic, if you want to call it that. Um, and I think that he started badly after having been given so much uh, leeway. But that cabinet, the day he pronounced the cabinet, was the day that I knew that we were in trouble, despite some of the individuals we think are impeccable. And one sign, I think, now when we go into the literature, that things were horribly wrong is getting the military into cabinet and into government. That was a sign that things were going to be horribly wrong uh, at the time. I mean, this is in retrospect, but at the time we all celebrated. And I, I for one, thought that this was going to be uh, a new, a new republic or a new way of doing things. If you remember the exchange rate at the time in November, it was like ninety percent premium. Right. And then it actually strengthened it on, actually the, on the strengthened. base on the basis and, of the and euphoria post, and enthusiasm. Post, post the coup, for the first four months of the year, money supply actually went down. People forget this. That actually money supply when in November of twenty seventeen, money supply was close to ten billion. It was nine point something billion, and from then December it actually came off, and up to March before the election period. It actually came down to $8 billion. And then from $8 billion, it then spiked up again. Right? And that's the problem. That you had all these good intentions, intentions and good faith. And people and actually opportunity. So, 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 and so, 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 so why biggest so, gripe is? So, so what lies at the core of this uh, deterioration? What went wrong? Uh, what went wrong is we destroyed governance that we've had for over hundreds of years. Because when you look at the literature- That sounds dramatic. we had never yeah, had- Yeah, I, I was just giving him a bit we, of rope. We had never, we'd never had a coup. And when you look at the well, literature- Well, we just agreed that 65 was sort of- No, when you look at the literature, it's not even considered a coup. Uh, this was actually our first coup. And what it did is it disrupted the way in which governance happened in Zimbabwe. And that's the most dangerous thing because we actually haven't invested enough in understanding coups. Because in West Africa, in Latin you know, America... In normal countries, you don't invest in understanding coups. <laughs> yeah, but then once it starts, once you have... The propensity for further coups goes up. It goes up and also it, it's a different dynamic. We need to invest, especially as economists or as business or whatever. We actually need to invest in actually understanding that the dynamics have changed. If it was Latin America or even West Africa, you, you've been in West Africa. A coup happens and but things every, are normal. Everybody, everybody knows what they need to do tomorrow. They, they exactly know what they need to do. You know, what happened in Guinea is a coup happens. The next day, the guy is actually telling businesses that actually, you know what, things will be normal. If anyone stops what you're doing... Please report them to me. But that's what happened here. Because um, but that's what happened here. We're no, open for business. You know, the, the, there's something that I want to fundamentally say. Uh, now you've destroyed my train of thought. Oh. Train of thought. And oh. this is the <laughs> this is the danger of having. Okay. A <laughs> All right. Anyway, yeah. Thank you. We, we stopped you from lecture. But you guys have left out uh, Smith, Smithonomics or UDI economics out of this whole discussion. It's, it was a war. We can both agree that it was a dangerous war. It cost the economy so much uh, in terms of capital, in terms of uh, immigration. People left. People who actually had the skill set, people who actually had money in this economy. Uh, and it was, the economy was, and I say the opportunity cost for Singapore. We were a bigger economy than Singapore. But by 1979, Singapore was now twice as big as sorry, the so, 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 Sorry, so you mentioned a couple of things, right? So, uh, 
you say there was a war. We don't have a war now. But there was mass immigration. Um, and capital the, flight. There was capital flight. And there were sanctions. Very similar to our current situation. How have we fared versus that picture? Well, look, I think um, if you look at the Smith regime, um, they made catastrophic, um, fatally poor decisions at a strategic level, right? Um, so the reason why they declared uh, unilateral independence is because they didn't want to transition to majority rule. And um, they weren't able to actually think through um, the consequences of that decision in terms of their capacity to continue to run a sustainable economy uh, <clears throat> and the costs of war and sanctions. Um, and, you know, that a significant um, percentage of their own community, the white community, would not be interested in sticking around. No, but, <laughs> so, okay, but, so, 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 but what I'm saying is, you, you, you in terms of... Words, eh? In terms of, in terms of, are we, are we, in terms, are we better off or worse off? In terms of, um, slightly better off. In terms of the, the, what they actually, the strategy they executed on, which is import substitution, they did it very well. They actually were competent in building industries that substituted a lot of the things they relied on, uh, from outside the country. But was it a great, was it a great strategy? No, it was a poor strategy. Mm. Uh, but they actually, you know, it's like they executed, they executed well. Could I disagree on that? Sure. There are lots of savings, right? So if you look at what uh, UDI had in 1965, you had a, a country that was bigger and more prosperous than Singapore. An economy. An economy uh, that was actually very strong and lots of savings. But by 1979, they were now in debt. Mm -hmm. So they had lots of money to play with. And I always say that this is the Zimbabwean case. When you look at Zimbabwe infrastructure-wise, right, we built so much infrastructure that compared to Kenya, it always felt like Zimbabwe is a much better economy. But when you look at the opportunity cost, what we did with that infrastructure, doesn't mean that Zimbabwe is performing better. It's only performing better because we're coming from a place where Excuse me. actually... Bless you. Well, this is the problem. Yeah. No, this is actually <laughs> good for, 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 for fleas. Should we call unless you have Unless you have COVID. No, I'm sure he'll see it. <laughs> Um, so it's that's why economy, economists always use this term of opportunity cost. Mm -hmm. uh, Smith's bad policies, import substitution, he was taking from our granary. He was taking from our savings. And he was directing it to economies or in sectors that he preferred, mm -hmm. right? That he so how is that different from command, from command and the status quo? No, no, you're, you're quite right. These were all seismic shifts in our economy. So when you look at 1890, the most significant seismic shift was 1965, but it was a seismic shift, but not too far off from the natural cause that we were already taking. Then 1980, it happens. It's another seismic shift. And I am saying that 19, 2000 was another, and 2017 now is another seismic shift. So if we, if we were to... to, to but, but, but to answer his question directly, right? When they decided that... Um, we needed to build a factory to make something that we import. They actually they built the factory and it worked efficiently and it made that product. I'm saying it 20 was years after land reform, I'm saying it, it was right, waste. we're still not getting the yields. Because we just don't have the savings anymore. Ian Smith actually had savings. Remember, but, but, you know, but you, you, guys, you guys are not in disagreement. Uh, you're saying, uh, what you're both saying is they delivered well on bad policies. No, I'm not saying that. That's what he's saying and I'm disagreeing. And I'm saying that uh, if somebody has lots of cash, did you say it was a bad policy? He's saying they. He's saying it was sustained by cash. It wasn't good execution. It Is wasn't good saying? execution. It wasn't. It was sustained because you actually had cash. There was so, lots so of you're, cash. So you're saying we could even run. even now we could run on command for decades if we had enough cash. If we had enough cash, simple and straightforward. Is command a bad policy? Yeah, but what's the it output of policy. command? What is the output of input substitution? Well, output of input substitution was Rhodesia was worse off in 1979 than in 1965. Was it import substitution of the war? No, it's actually, because remember the war then ignited or made them, uh, the strategy then became import substitution. But I'm saying if import substitution was actually a great policy. No, I'm saying, were the factories loss making or did, yeah, they did, were actually or did we get making. or did we get worse off because they were we bought Alouette helicopters from France via via and probably paid three times the price by the no, time they no, got here. There's that too, 
but also uh, a lot of the factories were lost making, but they were subsidized by the state. The state made it a, a mission to subsidize those industries, right? That they actually produced more widgets, because that's what you're saying, mm. that actually, you know what? It was great because they produced more widgets. Because we had conflicts. <laughs> And we'll build a factory and we we'll go conflict. And I am saying, actually, it was misallocation of resources because in 1965, this guy had tons of cash. But no conflict. And he blew. And he blew. No, but he had, you know, we, the economy could import as many conflicts as it needed. It was actually it performing. Not, it didn't need to build factories to, build, to, to, to manufacture them locally. Absolutely. I agree with you. So what I'm saying is from 1980, from 1890, right through to 1965, what we were doing is we were building capital, Right. To such an extent that we were actually, excuse me, uh, much bigger than a lot of the Asian countries. And what we did from 1965 to 1975 was we actually, went backwards. We, we destroyed went backwards. Capital. We actually destroyed that capital. And we continued on that march in exactly. 1980. In, in, in 1980, uh, so that's the first seismic shift. In the 1980s, a further seismic shift from the rails. So if the rails were here, uh, from my vectors, I hope my vectors are, uh, are correct. Rails? <laughs> just, let him, just, just, just let him finish. Just let him finish. <laughs> and what happened is, 1965, we were derailed. So we went off, maybe slightly, maybe 45 degrees. And by That's 1980... That's slight. <laughs> and is then there by... a pun in there somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> and maybe this is a good place for us to take a break. <laughs> we're going to go part our noses, relieve our bladders, and we'll be right back. And here we are. Uh, we're back. Are you calm? Have you, so. have you calmed down? I believe so. Bladder relieved? Glass topped? Yep, I'm doing good. Great. You see, I'm still on the same glass. Simba, I haven't had a second one yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so on the economics, I'm not sure we concluded, but I think we had some interesting discussions there on uh, the pros and the good and the bad of each of the epochs. But I think there's more to it than what we see in the economic numbers, right? So there's other aspects to look at it. Uh, social services, infrastructure. How do you look at the three epochs? Okay, so uh, when you say three, you're talking about the Second Republic. Smith, Mugabe, Nagago. Um, well, they, none of them did well economically. <laughs> no, but we've left that. Um, social services, education, health. Infrastructure, agriculture. So certainly in the 1980s, uh, there was significant investment in education. Um, and I think that one of the reasons why we enjoy these huge, uh, relative to our other exports anyway, uh, diaspora remittances, is because we have this uh, population of educated Zimbabweans living in South Africa and the UK mostly, um, that are employed and are able to send back meaningful amounts of money. And, and I think that's, um, the foundation of um, those remittances is the investments, uh, the most significant of which in education were made in the 1980s and 90s. I think um, between 1998 and 2008, you know, that's described by many as Zimbabwe's own lost decade. I think we saw the economy shrink by 60% in real terms. 
which is remarkable for a country in Russia's war. So, I, I, you know, we were just destroying capital. Even a country. <coughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, because Russia's economy hasn't shrunk that much. Or Ukraine. Uh, or Ukraine's even for that matter. So, um, yeah, we basically destroyed a lot of value between 1998 and 2008. The JNU was ushered in in 2009. And I think we kind of just steadied the ship. I, I, you know, apart from the work done on the uh, Plum Tree Motare Road, I can't think of any other significant infrastructure. Uh, oh, you mean in Kabe's time, yeah? Uh, yeah, in, during the GNU. Okay. Uh, yeah, I can't think of any other significant uh, infrastructure. Uh, Plum Tree. Uh, yeah, 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 Plum Tree Motare. Mm. Yeah, the, yeah. Um, no, no, I was about to put it in kilometers. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. okay, yes, thank you. Um, about 900 so, kilometers. So, yeah. you know, and that turned out to be a very expensive uh, project. In the um, Second Republic's epoch, you have uh, you know all these investments uh, in infrastructure with oh. local contractors. Although you know, and the airport is being significantly renovated as well. Um, but you know, it's it, they've recently been um, issues in terms of actually paying the contractors, and it's unclear to me that we're actually going to see these projects through to but, completion. But do you think the infrastructure is a good thing? No. So we've got the to the, it's, 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 to the extent that it's funded by the state, I think it's a bad thing. Um, I think that, you know... Will um, our grandkids care? If um, they wake up and their government is broke and they can't afford any social services, yes. They're not going to suddenly wake up and their government's <laughs> broke. <laughs> well, uh, I, mean, I mean, look, so... I think about it, uh, infrastructure differently. Um, I think that it's one of those things that is best driven by the private sector. Um, I don't think that it should be government's mandate. Because you see, here's the thing. Um, like, if you look at uh, Bay Bridge Junior, for example, okay, maybe um, the investments being made to dualize um, that route make sense. Maybe they don't, right? Yeah, if it's done by- that money could have been used also. Yeah, if it's being right. done by the taxpayer, and it turns out that we overinvested or we got it wrong, mm -hmm. it's a huge loss for the taxpayer. But if it's done by the private sector and they get it wrong, it's the private investors in that project who lose money. It's not the taxpayer. And I think this is true for a lot of uh, infrastructure projects where the government's role really should be to say, look, if you want to come and build these things, um, the door's wide open. These are the rules. You know, um, But especially for a poor country with no savings, um, and a, sm a small GDP. Yeah, you know, we, we, governments are generally across the world, even the best run governments, are very bad at capital allocation. Now, if you don't have a lot of capital to allocate in the first instance and you want to engage in that game, the downside risk is even more punishing. Mm. Okay, so, you, so you, you're saying, well, uh, GNU didn't do much. Uh, so between 2013 and 2017. In social services, the kids went back to school. Health was resuscitated to yeah. extend. The, we started seeing uh, a lot of budgetary support uh, from the uh, Western nations. We started seeing it in 2009. You know, that's when it actually kicked in. Kicked so in. I, th I think it was quite significant. But in terms of infrastructure, well, basically there wasn't any leeway to make any capital investments. Yeah. We're living hand to mouth. Yeah. But what about uh, pre-GNU? So Mugabe built us uh, Wange. What in Wange? Wange itself was built in the early 80s. Yeah, so... Um, and, and, but was it, was, it much, was it much other than so, so I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll you tell know, you, I'll off, tell you about... We turned off all the, the other... The small thermos. The, the small... The, the, the old. Let, me, let me tell you... Yeah, but, but we... The, <laughs> The important thing is power generation was actually decentralized and we got to centralized. centralized. Yeah, but that's so actually, actually, actually what happened in the 80s is that the biggest uh, coal producer in the country, Wange Colliery, uh, at independence in 1980, uh, the majority shareholders were Nick Van Hoogstraten and Anglo-American. And they, as a gesture of goodwill to the incoming uh, new republic, uh, donated significant portions of their holding to the government and actually made the government uh, the controlling shareholder. But um, in its wisdom in 1980, the government gave Anglo-American uh, management control until late in the 80s. And that thing was run like a well-oiled machine. It actually- Are we talking colliery or power station? I'm talking about the colliery. 
and the colliery is what uh, makes the power station viable. Because if the colliery is not working, uh, and you're not the getting enough station, coal out yeah. of the ground to feed the power station, then you're going to have issues. Well, actually, okay, we're going to go down a rabbit hole, but we need to. Actually, right now, the problem is not that we can't dig coal because we've privatized a lot of it and there's lots of small producers of coal. We can dig coal. Mm -hmm. The power station is just very, 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 very old. And it keeps on breaking down. <laughs> you know, I've heard, I'll, I'll tell you another fun story about that place. Is you know, So when you build these plants, um, the engineers who, um, or the contractor that builds it for you, uh, gives you a maintenance plan, you know, and if you stick to that plan, for the most part, the thing can run for its useful life, right? And we were so remarkably negligent in the way we ran that plant that uh, we ignored the maintenance plan until things broke in that plant that the original contractors oh, did not design to break. <laughs> that's exactly what happened with Zisco still. Anyway, anyway we're going on right now. So in, infrastructure-wise, so the major things we can think that Mugabe did outside the GMU was probably Wange. Anything else? What? Mugabe? Yeah. After oh, the GNU? Yeah. Before, outside the GNU. Before the GNU. Yeah, I think education. Uh, you have to give it to him in terms of education, in terms of healthcare. I mean, the number of schools that were built during Mugabe, Mugabe's years. I didn't start with Mugabe, but we have to give him credit. Uh, he expanded education. And primary uh, healthcare. And primary healthcare to such an extent that Zimbabwe's literacy rate actually moved up. So that was actually uh, quite significant. So that's a universities. I'm not so sure that was a good thing, but uh, in <laughs> terms of schools, because you know we, we need to. Zimbabwe cannot afford, you know, a, a university in every province. Simply cannot afford it, and this is a problem that South Africa is already starting to have. But I think that the education system, the base of our education system, uh, was very good, and he built on it, uh, primarily because and, he was a and teacher. He, he built dams. Uh, we, we always See, this is another classic dams. example of... So if you look um, at uh, per capita, uh, Rhodesia always had the largest number of dams. So even from 1980, uh, from 1890, people always forget this, that uh, this land never had water. The, yes. the we, rainfall we, patterns were always we, we live on the edge of the Sahara Desert. So so what made a significance... What, Sorry, not the Sahara. I don't know. The, 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 the Kalahari. Yeah. Mm. What made significance with uh, agriculture as far as this particular land was concerned was... We were one or, one or two of the only places where you could actually own title, right? So that was quite significant. So not that we could produce more than... Did he just uh, make up his own question? No, you asked about... So you say dams. So I'm trying to give you the context of why we have so many so, dams. So, so we go it's back to 1890. Yes, we do, because this land was always at erratic uh, rainfall. But going back to the new republic, uh, the, the second, second republic... republic. If you are, I don't like that title. I don't think it's okay. Okay, but going back to, can ask the, current, to, to the current, to dig up the history of that name, why? Yeah. Okay. Why are they styled the Second Republic? I don't, I've never understood. I've it. never understood it. I don't think it's correct. But yeah. anyway, uh, if you were to push me hard, and you know, I'm doing your job. If you were to push me hard <laughs> on what the new government has done, which is fundamentally different from Mugabe, is that they are not as socialist. So the mindset, the ideology. I mean, trying to talk. Prophet to Mugabe was like a swear word. Generally, he he his attitude because you had these business. discussions with him. Right? Well, you, you, you could guys tell. Used, you guys used to have tea together. I mean, you could tell. You could tell. You, you know that guy. Uh, <laughs> you know, you you start introducing business or economics or, or or private enterprise of any sort. That guy was just totally against that notion of private enterprise. And I think that these new guys, okay, they're going about it the wrong way. But I think that they are not as socialist as Mugabe was. And this, to me, why it gives me some sort of hope, this might be the last remnants of socialism in this, in this nation. So if you read through or in between the lines of what Mnangagwa says, is you know, private enterprises can start businesses and they can run businesses. We, we've, pri we've privatized the mint. Fidelity. No, so, not, so that not, actually not anymore. They, they, well, they, 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 they so this is these actually, are the still the problems that we have with that the, actually brings the to last mind ideological. One of the biggest missed uh, opportunities of the Second Republic, I was very. Uh, you said we're not supposed to use. Uh, I okay, Second I, I said that, not him. Um, you know, they actually came out and said, you know what, we're going to privatize all the parastatals. 
and which have been bleeding the fiscus, you know, since the 80s for the most part. And five years later, in fact, just this week there was an article about uh, the Paris State of needing 30 billion US dollars. <laughs> what? Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> That's like <laughs> one lifetime of GDP. Yes, to be, uh, you know, almost two times if, if you believe his numbers. You know, to, to, to be restructured and rehabilitated. But we could have sold all of these things for a dollar in November 2017 or maybe the next month in December or in January 2018. But they're still on the books. They're still bleeding the fiscus. What are they going to do? No, what are they going to do with thirty billion dollars? I don't know. I mean, it's remarkable to me that you know, um, it's almost like we get you know, to rock bottom. Do you know bottom how, do you know how much money lasting. thirty billion dollars is? Mm. I think ideologically we're not yet there, but I think that we, if Mugabe was extreme left, I think that Mugabe is slow. still left, but I think he is left moved. of center. No, no, no. He's still very much left. He's still command economics. But I think that he accepts private enterprise. In as far as private enterprise is concerned, I think that he's more accepting of private enterprise. Uh, that it happens in a corrupt way or it's clan-based, yeah, those are the nuances that we can speak to. But the idea that you can speak to him and he can actually say, you know what, make money, I can't see Mugabe saying that. No, but, but Mugabe created... He never said it. No, I mean, we've had Nigel Chanakira sitting there. I think yeah. where you're sitting. Mm -hmm. And Mugabe created people like Nigel Chanakira in the... And then what did he do? Well, that's besides the point. No. <laughs> <laughs> that is the point. Um, and, and, and I think that that's a... Perhaps we're on the right trajectory. Maybe not with these guys. I don't think that they can move away from command economics. But perhaps we're on the right trajectory that post an ED government, we will move towards the center. We're not yet anywhere near the center left. We're still very much uh, under command economics, but that command. But but, but let, let me ask you because mm -hmm. I think you know one of the things that uh, vexes me uh, when I review the last five years of uh, the so-called Second Republic is that um, at the beginning of their tenure, they seemed very much left of center, right? They mm -hmm. they they said we're open for business. Mutuli before he was sworn in was saying. There are no good reasons why we can't expunge sanctions. There's nothing in the sanctions that is not in our interest to do anyway. Um, you know, so we spoke about all the right things, uh, privatizing parastatals. We made commitments not to reintroduce the Zim dollar unless we had reserves, unless the economy was in. So we said all the right things, mm. right? And this is not... Um, you and me, an proje you and me you an projecting, answer, you know, what they were saying. This is literally what they said. So, how do you explain? Well, this is literally what we're saying. Mm. Have you ever watched this well, uh, British but, 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 comedy show called uh, Yes Prime Minister, Yes Minister, and then Yes Prime Minister? That's the bureaucracy has not changed. So, while it is true that Nangagwa is somewhat not extreme left, the bureaucracy is still very much left. So you, you so go with, you, uh, was that Mutango who said the presidency is a straight jacket? I'm not so sure uh, I, I buy into that. Because I think that the presidency, ideologically, we should be governed by the president's ideology. And the president has firmly accepted. But, but you're blaming that, the people around him. No, I'm saying that while the top guy might not be left of left, Far left, that's Far a left. much better expression. Please. Okay. Left of left is right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You weren't very good at maths, were you? <laughs> so, um, so while the, um, the current president is not far left, unfortunately the bureaucracy which he has inherited is very much communist. So it's not even socialist. It's extremely communist. So when you look at GMB, for example, I'm sure if we go to the president and explain that GMB is a bad idea. He might actually agree to it. That you think GMB he does? A bad you idea. think he doesn't know that we only have ninety thousand tons of wheat and it started raining, so there's no more wheat coming. I think he knows, but the actual bureaucracy, for the bureaucracy to play out his ideology, it's very difficult because all they've ever known is communism. That's all they've ever known. You have people in government who've been in government for the last forty years, so that that. Bureaucracy on its own. So while he might have good intentions, the bureaucracy itself 
doesn't know anything but communism. So you, so you know, you decide ism, and and why I referred to uh, yes minister or yes prime minister is you get to understand how the bureaucracy works. That if the bureaucracy is working against you as a president, it's just going to be very difficult for you to play out your plan. And we actually have a very top heavy bureaucracy. So if the bureaucracy has decided that this is the way we're going to go, the only reason why we stopped command agriculture is because there actually wasn't any money. But philosophically, well, the bureaucracy, wow, well, we've reduced. Our exposure to command agriculture has reduced substantially, primarily because there's no money. Uh, but if you we, have, to, we have a huge outstanding guarantee. Yeah, no, they, they, and, and that's part, part of the reason why it has substantially reduced. But if you go into the bureaucracy, the actual government bureaucracy at the, at the all the PEMSECs, if I were the president, I would fire all the PEMSECs. Okay, I, but, I don't know this guy. Uh, <laughs> I would he's not my friends. <laughs> I would retire. But, 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 but a lot of them were actually mm -hmm. retired. Everybody, I think in, in the early months of the, uh, the no. second... Uh, a few uh, of them were. Okay. They were moved to OPC <laughs> and all sorts. But I would retire all the PEMSECs and even director level. Because I, I think they're also too old. A lot of them are beyond 65. No, no, but um, does age matter? Yeah, unfortunately... It does. You're a fan of Trump? Yeah. He's so, almost 80? Yeah, and I don't think Trump should run at all. But he, I think that, but he was president in the 70s. Yeah, but I think that Trump is gone. You know, there's uh, DeSantis, a man in his 40s, who has clearly showed the way. And I don't think that Trump should run at all. This, he, he doesn't even understand. I think Trump doesn't even understand that the world has changed. The world has fundamentally okay. changed. I, I don't think I should have mentioned that. Um, go down a rabbit hole. But, but the but, point but, but, of the saying, saying, um, no, we're not, we're yeah, not going to talk about rabbit hole. Um, no, no, we, we're, not doing, doing. we're not doing an American. He's a fantastic guy. We're not doing American elections <laughs> rabbit hole. You guys had your thing last week with, with Elon Musk, <laughs> and I wasn't here. Done. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, but going back, uh, maybe let me make it uh, very succinct. The bureaucracy is what runs a government. Politicians can come with their own ideas of how to run it. But if the bureaucracy has not changed, and if the bureaucracy is still communistic, the same guys who came in in the 80s are still the same guy. I'm going to push back, though. I'm going to say, yeah, go I'm going to say um, <clears throat> so the Communist Party of China was founded in uh, 1921, um, and Mao was a key player in this, and he ran that thing for decades in a certain way. He had a certain way of looking at the world. And Deng actually was around for most of that time. But when Mao died and Deng ascended to power, he saw that Mao's way didn't work. Okay, I, I sense a rabbit hole coming. And, and, he, I, and he pivoted. And, uh, uh, no, no, please. This no, is fantastic. No, no, you guys can, you guys can do a special... And, 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 no, and, and no, no, no. We're gonna right. I mean, this okay. is perfect. We're going to run out of time. <laughs> can we switch this discussion? So... We've, this was getting very interesting. No, we're not doing this. We've dwelt on the last five years. But at least let's let him finish his Can argument. We, no, no, no. Because <laughs> no. I was I'm back. I'm back. <laughs> I'm back. Okay. We're not doing All this. Right. Okay, George. Um, so we've dwelt on the last five years. What should... Who, we've got an election coming up. Uh, we don't know who's going to win. But what should whoever wins early next year be looking to do in the next five years? So for me, the answer is... is um, quite simple. All of the things that they actually said they would do uh, in the aftermath of the coup in November 2017, uh, Zimbabwe being open for business, Zimbabwe building reserves and not having a local currency unless it made sense. Uh, you, want another, you want another currency change? No, no, no. Well, <laughs> the current regime isn't working. All right. But what, all I'm saying is if they just w chose to be faithful to the commitments they made in the aftermath of the coup, I think our country would be on the right trajectory. That's and, all we need to do. And what are the key cornerstones of those commitments? So follow through on being open for business, right? Uh, follow through on uh, all the things they said around how they're going to manage the currency and spending. Follow through on, you know, all the positives that they uh, enunciated, which they didn't follow through on. And that's why the, the performance has been so abysmal. Like, I mean, to put it into perspective, if you had a dollar in your bank account, you know, um, the day after I'm going to be resigned, right, you've lost 99.9% .9 of your value between that day and today. 
if you just kept it there, if you were just saving. <laughs> That's, it's, it's dramatic. It's like, so, so the performance is abysmal, right? And we certainly need to pivot. So what I would argue from a government's perspective is, and back to, and I like the way you sort of framed uh, uh, today's program from Smith years oh, to Mugabe. You have some and nice now, things to say about that. Yeah. You missed Apart yeah. from cutting me off. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're sometimes, not doing that. <laughs> sometimes. Um, but we also miss if, you, if, you, if you think about it, Zimbabwe is highly politicized. We need to move away from the politics. And the only way we could do it, and that's my view, is if we have a head of government, if we have a prime minister who's not political at all. So while 1980, he was a, an executive prime minister who was a, a, a political appoint, uh, a, appointee, what we need to move away from is having a prime minister who is directly but, elected. But, but we have one. But the person you're talking about is... It Chief Secretary to Cabinet? No, Prime Minister. Did you know? No, but yeah. if, he's, if he's not politically appointed, then he's a Chief Secretary. He, he's, then no, he's an employee. No, no, no. We need to create a position where we actually have a Prime Minister. So if you look at almost all coup cool governments, if you look at uh, Gaddafi, if you look at uh, these Egypt... These are fantastic at, examples that should inspire you know, us. Everywhere. Jerry Rawlings? Jerry Ro Rawlings. Did he have the same? Um, no, no, no. He didn't. But if you look at the, the people that actually changed where are people who realize that the contestation in Zimbabwe is political, but everything else, people want to have no more lies, right? So political contestation should happen at presidency level, and they should have some sort of power, political power, but they should be able to appoint a prime minister who runs the government, who runs government programs, who is an so appointee I, I want to push back strongly. of the president. But you know what? But we give you a chance. We, yeah, we give you a chance. Carry on. Yeah, I'm, me, just, I, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just putting <laughs> one across the bow. Yeah, but then this is, this is a problem that you know, okay. you're not going to okay. actually okay. understand my, my argument. My argument is once you have a head of government, you have somebody where right now, if the president is not happy with cabinet, they have to fire everybody in cabinet. Well, the opposite could be very true that uh, if the president is not happy with cabinet, he's not happy with the prime minister. And you can just fire the prime minister and you get another prime minister and you can do that without any political upheaval. And that allows government programs to allows a government programs to run according to the president's uh, ideology. And I say this, notwithstanding what's going to happen politically, I think that uh, what has been wrong in Zimbabwe is our heightened politics. So even if I think that it's a very good time for us to change our constitution and we create a prime minister. And a prime minister is appointed by the president and that prime minister will carry out government's work and will change the bureaucracy. Because now what we need to change is a bureaucracy. So We've got a bureaucracy that's highly politicized. So you want a CEO of government? Yes, that's what it is. So, if so, you look so, at almost so. every cool government that does well, they have a CEO of government and who takes away the politics and says, this is government policy. So they wanted to privatize, right? If you think about it, the president comes out and he says, I want to create jobs. I want to privatize. It's always open for business. Well, why is it not trickling down to the bureaucracy? Well, it's because the bureaucracy is... Were you about to swear? <laughs> <laughs> <Anyway. Yes. laughs> um, so, no, the bureaucracy is highly politicized. It's highly communist. We, got, highly, we get that. We get that. And you have CADA uh, Deployment. deployments. Right? Who are political beings, which shouldn't be. If you're a political so, being, remain political, be in a central committee as a political being, drive policy as a political being. But when it comes to the bureaucracy, we should okay. take away politics. I think, I think you've made your point. So, 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 so uh, you know, I, I tend to disagree. I think if you look at the way people think about economic ideology, right? So, um, you know, so. For example, you know, to use your case of the bureaucracy that um, is steeped in uh, uh, socialist uh, or communist doctrine, communist, right? Yeah. Um, if if you look at history, you know, um, people tend to get swayed when dramatic things happen. So, for example, um, in the 1930s, when there was the Great Depression in the U.S., I hope we're not going to walk from the 1930s. No, 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 <laughs> no. I'm not. I'm just, I'm just giving an example, right? Um, that was when um, the number of people in the U.S. who thought that communism was a good idea peaked, right? Because they were going through all the suffering and it looked like things were better 
in the Soviet Union. And I think what we, our challenge really, and you, you hit the nail on the head when you described um, the mindset in the bureaucracy, is that they look at the world in a particular way. And one of the indictments on the business community over the last five years is that we have done an atrocious job in articulating to the bureaucracy and the politicians that, you know what, you will actually be better off if the economy is doing well, if it's thriving, if it's growing. And these things are not political, right? But the president <coughs> is accepted privatization. When you yeah, but what I'm saying is what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so, so, but, so, 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 so I'm not disagreeing so with what you're saying. Abysmal. I'm saying, I'm saying it's the business community's job to articulate a vision for economic growth to the bureaucracy. Because if you're running a business, right, right you, you interface and engage okay, with the bureaucracy I, I, anyway. I understand right? where you guys are different. So, so, so you're saying it's about the structure of government. Yes. And he's saying... And process, structure yeah. and process. And he's saying, actually, we can't expect government to know better. It's up to those of us with vested interests in policy to get government to understand. You can't implement your, pol your policy. Our current structure of government, you can't implement your policy. No, no, what I'm saying is, if the mindset, like, okay, can we agree? Let me, can I walk change. you through this slowly? <laughs> yeah, sure. Right? What's in it? <laughs> right now, you have a bureaucracy with a communist slash socialist mindset, right? If, and it's structure and processes. Yes, 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 yes. If, for the sake of this discussion, you could wave a magic wand and change their mindset to being more free market capitalistic, would that be significant? No, it wouldn't. Because the structure of government... I okay, right, gentlemen. So the structure of government is very communist. Well, maybe you don't understand what communism and how... Okay, we don't, we're, not gonna, we're, we're, not going down, down, we're not going down that road. <laughs> but I, I, think what, I think what we've successfully done, gentlemen, is we've laid down two succinct arguments. Mm. Could, and, could I, could and I and just a, rebut, uh, a rebuttal to his argument? I mean, honestly, we can't let him go. Yeah, but then you want to rebut yours. But I think we... And which he, he tried to no, do. But, but you've got these lengthy threads on Twitter and Elon Musk is going to mm. make you write pages now. So <laughs> you, you, can, you can take it up there. Uh, Tinashe but, followers, beware. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think we've laid out two different ideas of the, the way forward. I think it will be very interesting to have interactions with the viewers on our social media pages. I know... I can see it in you. You're gonna, tomorrow morning, you're going to churn out Not a, even. a 25 Not even. tweet thread. Only? Oh, 25? Mm -hmm. No, I'm looking forward to what Elon has in store. You know, I mean, it's, it's going to be extremely and you, and exciting. You're going to buy your own blue tick? Engaging. Oh, yeah, I am. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Anyway, as you can see, we have no idea what we're talking about. We're just a bunch of guys enjoying a bit of tipple and heated shrubs mm -hmm. on a Friday evening and trying to make sense of the world. We hope that this inspires you to have some thoughts about how some of these things should be done. We hope it inspires you to talk to people around you. And if you have access to politicians and policymakers, we hope this inspires you to have some of these discussions with the people that have the power to make Zimbabwe a better place. Because in the end, that's all any of us want. Have a lovely weekend. Stay safe. Be good. If you can't be good, be good at it. <laughs>